The Trader Cobb Crypto Show, talking business in blockchain. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Trader Cobb Crypto Show. It's Craig Cobb with you guys, and today I've, I've got a guest that's going to probably blow your mind. I've got Gavin Brown, who's a co-founder of Blockchain Capital and senior lecturer at the Manchester Metropolitan University. Try and say that fast five times. Gavin, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, good morning, Craig. Thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate you inviting me on. Well, let me just say one thing for the viewers and listeners out there. When Gavin says good morning, it is three o'clock where Gavin is, so the pleasure is all mine. You're doing it within my business hours, which is a change for me for a UK guest. So thank you, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> no problem at all. No problem. Right. Let's get straight into it. Mate, you're probably one of the most fascinating people I'm going to speak to. And I'm not saying that to blow smoke up your backside. I'm saying that because the amount of stuff that you've got here that you've done and that you're doing, I can't wait to go through some of this and really get to the to the bottom of why you're here. Do you want to start off by just telling us a little bit about your background and, um, and what you've been doing into the space prior and as well as what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, first of all, yeah, th thanks again for having me on. I, I came into the space about three, three and a half years ago. Um, I was giving a talk at my university um, to the Chamber of Commerce, so sort of lo local business leaders. Um, and someone approached me keen to set up a fund, a vehicle to make it easier for institutional clients. Um, to actually invest in this space, given the, the, the hardship and the technical challenges of actually getting involved. Um, so that was kind of my introduction to it. But in terms of my background, prior to that, um, I'm a chartered accountant by background. Um, I trained as a financial services auditor, looking at brokerage firms, mutual funds, pension funds, things like that, mainly in the UK. Uh, and then I moved into investment banking in London, worked for Merrill Lynch, now, uh, now part of Bank of America, obviously. Um, and then in 2007, did an MBA at University of Oxford and set up a, a hedge fund uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, right in the middle of the financial crisis. So that was a joy, um, mm. but good experience. Um, but since then, I've been an academic and now sort of moving back into the world of, uh, of fund creation and fund management um, alongside my obvious, obviously prime interest, which is that of an academic and actually researching and thinking about, you know, how these things get valued and, and what this is going to look like over the sort of medium to longer term as well. Wow. Now you've, um, you've been in this investing in blockchain space for probably more than most, I'm going to say. Um, what was it that brought you into it? Why, why with your expertise and with your background, why here? What is the real driving force? Um, I think really just a, a genuine fascination on how we, this literally upsets not just centuries of banking and capitalism, but millennia, right? I mean, mm. I don't know what your memories are of this, but I remember when I first sat down, I kind of had this skeptical this is funny money. This is never real. These gains aren't real. You know, I calculated the alpha before I went in in Excel and it came up as hashes. I was like, oh, I've done it wrong. Uh, and actually, it was because it was so big, it wouldn't fit in the column, uh, wow. <laughs> which was amazing. Um, but the very first time I moved money without, um, without a bank, without a payment network or infrastructure, I was like, wow, you know, I, I don't care that there's downsides and everyone sort of talks about the dark web and all negative rumors. There's negativity in any new technology. For me, the ability to move money without an intermediary as a, in a centralized form um, is completely revolutionary. And how it plays out, who knows, but there's got to be some genuine profit potential in there. Mm. Um, obviously, I'm interested in the philosophical ideals of you know, where this stuff started and, and, and how people sort of libertarianism, etc. But for me, I'm less about that. I'm more about, well, you know, this is genuinely, A, it's cool. Um, and B, it's going to have some seismic effects on many different industries. Um, and I want to be a part of that. Yeah. And look, how long has the, uh, the, the blockchain capital fund itself been up and running? Um, we incorporated, um, I think it's about two and a half years ago, um, and really went through all kinds of convoluted um, ideas about, you know, how do we get a route for market? So, um, you know, there's one thing having an idea and, and setting up your name and getting branded is quite another thing in getting regulated um, as well as actually thinking about what your investment vehicle is going to be. So we went around um, looking at different types of products, different types of jurisdictions, um, looking at about whether we would have some kind of index type structure. I mean, this is at a time when there wasn't really any established indices out there. Mm. Um, and they represent a whole different type of business model, actually. You know, having the, it's generally like almost like a royalties play. 
I mean, for your listeners who are familiar with things like the VIX, the volatility index, you know, there's yeah. as much money to be made from actually Try to creating a benchmark. Yeah, exactly. As much as actually having an investable product, which can be sold. Um, and then obviously, just as we got close to a situation where we're ready to, to, to hit go, um, the market went where we didn't want it to go. Um, so we're now in a state of really just still, still exploring, still talking to people and making sure that if and when that the market comes back, which hopefully it will, that we're A, in a position to go um, and B, in a position where people will then look to us as a voice of credibility when times were tough. Because you know, anyone can call a market when there's a rising tide, right? It lifts all boats. The, the key is, is to be that voice of reason when it's hard to be that voice of reason is, is the way we sort of see that. Well, you could say even a turkey would fly in a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's better. I prefer your one. <laughs> Look, um, I, I, I note on the blockchain capital website, it says you've got a huge amount of active investments. I mean, there's, there's so many companies here and, and a lot that I know of. How did you like, you've been busy. Yeah. Yeah. Really busy. I mean, uh, the important thing to note is, I mean, just to double check exactly because there's, there's more than one blockchain capital as well. This is something to make sure your listeners are clear of. So we're incorporated in the UK. Um, yep. There's a, a much larger um, active traded fund, I think out of the U S there's also another one over in Hong Kong. So it's a common name, but obviously with multiple jurisdictions. Yep. Um, but for us, we're, we're obviously based, based in the, in the UK. So there's been a lot going on now. One of the other things I want to touch on as well is, and I'm, I'm, I'm look, guys, I'm, I'm literally reading this from the sheet because there is so much to go through. I've got some things highlighted. I'm just going to be honest here. This is not my memory recall going through this. This is me just doing what I do. <laughs> you have talked to so many different publications and whatnot. I'm really interested in a couple. You have uh, spoken, done commentary on cryptocurrencies and tokenomics to the House of Lords. Now, what was that? How did that go? And, and look, what I'm really interested in is what's their attitude towards this space? Um, yeah, so um, that's part of uh, an organization here in the UK called BBFA, which is led by uh, Patrick Curry, MBE. Um, and he is a gentleman who I did a talk as part of my academic work at HMRC, who are the tax authority here in the UK. Um, and they approached me and just said, you know, would you be willing to get involved with um, a wider government and industry response? So what we're doing here in the UK, led by a gentleman called Lord Chris Holmes of Richmond, who sits in the House of Lords. Uh, he's a, a big fan and a big champion of uh, distributed ledger technology. Um, so not just cryptocurrencies, very minor part of it, absolutely everything in the sort of fintech space. And then he's basically put together, along with this organization called BBFA, a suite of working groups. There's about 40, I think each of them focusing on a different industry. So you've got sort of aerospace, manufacturing, retail, finance. Um, and I sit inside one working group, which is called the academic work. And the, general, the general sort of remit is for each of these groups to be a collection of industry leaders in that particular industry who are very pro on fintech, crypto assets, et cetera. Uh, and their role is A, to network and exchange ideas of best practice, but more importantly, to try and advise civil servants, politicians, and really with a view to making sure that the UK is on the front foot when it comes to leveraging these technologies, um, especially in an economy like the UK, which is largely knowledge-based. You can't afford to be left behind on something as important as this. Um, and so that's, that's how that opportunity came up and, and how it's structured. And is that... Is that in the same realm as your talk with Treasury? Is that sort of intertwined together? Or is that a separate matter as well? Uh, separate matter, really. I mean, the, the, the stuff I did at the Treasury and HMRC, um, it was in the old uh, Winston Churchill rooms, which was kind of cool in, wow, in London. Wow, that'd be rad. Yeah. History. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was, it was on, uh, in the same, I don't know if you remember, there's a balcony where he did his famous V for Victory sign. Yep. Uh, it was in that room just behind there. Oh. Um, but yeah, that was, that was really just part of the, my university. I'm, I'm part of a, a center called the, the, the Future Economies Research Center. So we look at all kinds of you know, future stuff, you know, smart cities, Brexit, obviously everyone looks at that. Yeah. Um, but I focus on cryptocurrencies. So I went there to talk to them about you know, what they are, everything from the fundamentals of blockchain, not necessarily in a technical way, but more in a kind of a, what does it mean for the economy sort of way. Um, and as well, talking to them about, you know, how does Bitcoin work? What do the crypto current currencies look like? How do they trade? And then perhaps most importantly, they then want to know is, you know, what are the challenges for policymakers? And, you know, how do we tax these things, if at all? Um, and then how is this going to play out? Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? What do we need to be, to be looking at here? Which is of interest to governments. But at the same time, if you're an investor and a trader, that's exactly the same question you're asking yourself. You know, how do I make sure that I, I capitalize on this and make, make some kind of cash, you know? So. 
Absolutely. And just the fact that it, it, it sounds like they're really open to learning. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think um, I think the UK. I mean, probably only second to a few other countries. Maybe maybe Switzerland's probably more on the front foot. I would say, but um, they're very pro. I mean, if you look at the regulator here, the FCA, uh, mm. the Financial Conduct Authority, um, they've got a, a what's called a regulatory sandbox. So if you come along as a as a as a fintech where you're leveraging um, blockchain or cryptocurrencies or maybe both, you probably don't fit the existing rule system. But rather than say goodbye to you, um, they're quite happy to bring you in into this sort of sandbox environment where they can keep an eye on you but they allow you to still go ahead and, and challenge the norms and the general business models of normal practice so it's a really i think forward way of looking at it and making sure that and it's almost a recognition of the space in that terms that there's genuine innovation there and different ways of of, of doing things in the, in the capital markets so are we seeing the uh the uk as a whole uh, the government of course being involved with this are they moving yeah. towards trying to create some sort of a hub kind of like a silicon valley are they going to be funding projects i mean how does it look for the government how are they trying to or what are the conversations that they're having because obviously for them to be ahead of the curve they need to create something that helps to add to that curve i mean we need projects need funding they need good leadership they need good governance they need good people they need to network and we've seen uh, Silicon Valley being the easiest to, uh, to talk about in the tech sector because it's the place where people go. And it's still the place where people go. It's shifting now. Austin, Texas, as I've learned now in blockchain, it's one of the biggest centers in the world for that sort of thing. Is the UK looking to enter that sort of space in that way? Or, is, or are they looking to sort of try and be the regulatory framework for which they lead the world forward and therefore attract the projects there because they do have that framework in place? What side, or is there a third or fourth or fifth fifth option what option are they looking at how are they going to be different yeah i think um i mean how they're going to be different is a real challenge isn't it i mean i think one of the problems we've got here in the uk is that over the last year and a half to two years the without talking politics but the whole brexit issue has sucked the life and energy and oxygen out of the room with respect to everything even mm -hmm. looking at you know having the energy and, and the money and the willpower to look at you know a new asset class and how can we leverage it and how can we control it and regulate it um, notwithstanding that, though, a lot of the universities are very forward-looking. So I know over at the uh, University of Cambridge, um, they've got an alternative finance division who are specialists in this area. They team up with a lot of industrial partnerships as well. Um, but I think a lot of this is almost like a recognition that you know financial services in the UK is the number one industry for, for yeah. us as a country. Um, and you know when you look at the market share of different financial service uh, sort of instruments, you know we've got more than 50% of um, uh, interest rate derivatives. We've got about 30 to 40% of FX derivatives. You know a lot of stuff comes through the UK. So it's about, I guess, preserving that sort of market leadership to a point in certain markets. Um, and I think the FCA sandbox is a really good, a really good way of them doing that, both from a regulatory perspective and the sort of attracting that talent. And I think if any of your listeners are interested, you know, just just Google it, just just put in FCA sandbox, and you you can see listed there cohorts of of companies, and it gives you a brief description of the sort of thing that they're trying to do in the fintech world and how they're doing it differently. I think there's about five or six cohorts now, but it's a really nice way of seeing, you know, how the the big players are like running these little subsidiary experiments mm. and the sort of things they're trying to disrupt. It's almost like a little marker for where things might be ten years out, if you like. Yeah, and uh, and a bit of an understanding as to what they're looking for. If ever you're looking to build something, it's a very important way yeah. to do it. You've got to, you know, you, it's not just about having a product that the people want. It's got to be a product that, that we can have that other people will allow to have, i.e. governments. You know, the Silk Road was a product that worked really well. I mean, it, it was a wonderful functioning economy. Um, mm. But of course, governments weren't going to let that stand. So it's about matching the product with the regulation to have longevity. And it's about timing. So those sandboxes can certainly help with the timing aspect of it. Speaking yeah. of timing. Coming into this now, coming back to the fun side, thank you for letting us have that insight into uh, what's going on over there. I, I'm fascinated. I, I do have a very close um, love of the UK. I spent a lot of time. I spent six years over there. I got family over there. It's a place that um, I don't think I could live over there anymore now that I've been in Sydney, in Bondi Beach for, for the last sort of eight years. And I've got a couple of kids now, but I can't wait to get back over there. I, I do miss my friends and, and the people that I met. Lovely place. Really enjoyed my time there. When it comes to your fun, so you talked about, you know, things went pear-shaped right at the wrong time or maybe right at the right time because you wouldn't want to be investing just before it went down you'd be in a much more sticky situation so are you guys now in the position where you're effectively uh, funded and now you're looking for projects to work with for the next move i mean wh where is the fund situated right now as it stands 
Um, so right now, yeah, we're, we're not, we're not, um, we're not launching. So if, let, let's say for instance, someone's came to us and said, you know, we're, I'm interested in investing. Um, we're literally not open for business in that sense. So we've literally taken a decision and this was, this was, um, a year or so back to literally hit pause, you know, so we've still got a company, um, it's technically there. We've got a brand. We've obviously got a strategy, lots of research papers, you know, all that, all the legwork that went into it. Um, but we're in a situation where we've literally just backed off and said, right, well, we've done all that work. We can hit pause. Um, yeah. but we're not in a position where, uh, I mean, you know, I'm an academic, that's my main role. Um, so we weren't in a situation where we were just going to take people's money and, and run with institutional money, um, just for the sake of just skimming off a little bit of management fee, destroying mm. some people's uh, value and, uh, and having a terrible record and shutting shop. You know, that's not what we're about at all. So, um, we just made the decision that it's not the right time um, and just to sit back and continue to, to talk to people, to educate, um, but not to be open for business or to launch just yet. Um, so, yeah, but obviously the, the key challenge we have now is, is we as directors, if you like, um, is to talk regularly, monitor the markets and, and be, be looking for those, those green shoots um, before people start to say, yeah, actually, we're in a situation where we want to hit go again, you know. So what are those green shoots that you're looking for? Um, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, and this is, this is, I guess my, my prediction is, is I see the institutionalization of the space being almost an inevitability. And I think, you know, when we saw the JP Morgan coin, um, even if we can call it a coin, right? I mean, obviously that's debatable, but JP Morgan coin being announced when we see the rumors coming out of Facebook and, you know, saying this half year, we potentially see a cryptocurrency occurring. Um, that, that, that for me is almost a, a recognition in the space that, mm that there's some genuine use cases here. And although that's contrary to the very original philosophies of, you know, decentralization, actually what we could see is that, is that this enables it to come to the masses, right? Because, you know, one of the things that always puzzles me and people often say is, well, you know, cryptocurrencies are so good. You know, we can have microtransactions. I can move money in real time. It's completely transparent. It's decentralized. It can be anonymous if I want it to be. It's got all these extra things that normal money can't do. Mm. You know, why are we 10 years on and still it's only a minority of people who trade it or use it. Uh, you know, I gave a talk at um, a business school about six months ago to about 300 people, all MSC, 25 year old, young guns types. Uh, and I asked at the start, how many people have used or traded a, traded a cryptocurrency? And there's about three people in the room, incredibly small numbers. Wow. And I think even though we're in this space, so you talk about it every day, I talk about it every day, read, et cetera, you, you sort of think that everyone's on board. And actually when you take that step back, you realize that, this is still almost bleeding edge. It's still very nascent. Um, and the problem is, is that, you know, you think about introductions of new tech, so, you know, mobile phones, Facebook, when, when innovations happen, they tend to happen now. The adoption rates are incredibly fast. You know, within yeah. a year, two years, everyone's on board. And yet we're 10 years on with this new form of money and still, you know, not just is not everyone on board, actually only a very, very few people are actually on board at all. Um, and that raises a difficult question, you know, is there a problem with it or is there something else blocking it? And for me, it's the, it's the regulatory hurdle. Yep. It's this notion that, you know, I've spoken to money managers um, just sort of candidly and often they've said, you know, I could never, I could never go into that space. You know, I couldn't recommend it for my clients. Uh, but if you ever hear of anything, I'd love to be involved personally. You know, you have to get that sort of, you know, it's not good enough for my clients, but it's good enough for me as a personal interest. And until we, until we get that regulatory framework and almost that institutional green flag, um, I don't think we're going to be in a situation where it can be rolled out to the masses. And by definition, you know, any, any, any coin offering or currency is only as strong as the number of people who use it. So it benefits us all to be, for it to be as widespread as possible. So the green shoots, we're looking for more acceptance uh, and we're looking for regulation. I think so. I think regulation is a key part. I know it's very divisive in the cryptocurrency. Well, you're speaking to the space. converted man right here. I, mean, I, I know like from my point of view, uh, for, for anything to thrive, uh, you know, I know fund managers, uh, I've had a little fun myself. I understand the traditional markets. I understand how business works. And anyone who's anybody in, in any business or in any firm or fund the bottom line has got to be about risk. And if it's not, then stay the hell away from them. It's got to be about managing the downside. Now, without regulation, well, how do we manage that? You know, who's responsible for these mistakes that are made? One thing I read recently, and you probably got onto this before I did, AXA is now teamed up with somebody, I can't remember the name of the company, to offer um, insurance on STOs and crowdfunding. Now, that is a big step in the right direction from my point of view because it brings that legitimacy of another massive multinational company. It's AXA. It's huge, right? They're coming in and they're saying, well, we're going to offer a product of insurance 
beside these tokens and, and this new economy, which is crowdfunding is huge. And so is STO about to be. It's, it's the next progression in my eyes. And having, as you say, JP Morgan, um, having AXA involved as well, and a number of other companies coming involved. Like ICE is sort of, sh- I suspect they're going to shelve their plans for a little while, I'm much the same as yourself, and, and just keep a, a core development team there and cut their costs and be ready for when it comes off because they're going to need clients and clients don't want to be involved in a market that keeps falling. Yeah, and I think I think that, that you hit the nail on the head there when you said ready as well. You know, I, I talk a lot at um, various investment banks, large financial institutions, um, and and often you know you'll see and talk to the the work that they're doing in terms of cryptocurrencies, blockchain, etc., uh, and they're doing so much internally that isn't in the public domain. And often I will say, is like you know, so you, you know, you guys are ready to go then with this. And and I remember why well, I won't say the name, but they were like, well, yes, we are ready, but we won't go. And I was, and what, my question was, well, why? And the, and the problem is they said, well, in financial services, we can't afford the reputational risk Correct. of moving and then suffering reputational loss and, and getting burnt. However, we equally can't afford to let things get ahead of us. So we're in a state of readiness if and when. So I almost, the analogy I always use is almost, you know, when you see the wildlife programs where there's a river and there's wildebeest and they're all sort of packing up at a, at a crossing point and then eventually one, one goes. Jumps. And then off they go. <laughs> so you That's know, a really, I, I, we love an analogy on this show, and you, that was a really good one because I just got the perfect visual of it. And then who's the crocodile? <laughs> <laughs> That's always what follows that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm still convinced of the space, and I, I think for me, the biggest fear is 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 that notion of I don't want to look back on this period of time and go, mm. I was in early, um, I was educated about it, I, I called it but I was either not in the position to have my funds applied properly, mm. or maybe even worse than that, I just chose incorrectly. You know, how many people saw the dot-com space develop, um, invested, but put them on the wrong stocks, right? Because with this, you've almost got to run like a private equity type model. Yeah, then on coin market cap now, there's what, 2,100 plus coins? Yep. You know, we could see 95% of those disappear inside three to five years. Yeah, Absolutely. so you, you've got to run a portfolio, haven't you, inside the space? Um, and I guess that, that's, that's the thing that I worry about and get anxious about is making sure that I'm genuinely picking out those real t- use cases, which 10, 20 years out may be, you know, your, your next Netflix or whatever it might be coming forward, you know. Well, that's the aim for all of us there, Gavin. We're all doing our best to find the best looking projects, build the best businesses, do the most for the, edu- the education of the, of, the, uh, of the whole space going forward. There's a lot of work to do. You're up at 3 a.m. I'm often still working at 3 a.m. It's just the way it has to be when you're at this level and there's so much to do. And I'm in the same position as you, mate. I, I saw this, uh, I was brought, it was brought to my attention and I sort of looked at it again, kicking and screaming because in 2013, I was brought to the understanding of what Bitcoin was. I was trading myself. I was a, not a tech VC. I wasn't a, in, interested in tech at all. I just liked to trade and do what I did. So I kicked it to the curb and people say, oh, to me, you know, aren't you spewing that you did that? And I'm like, no, because I would have broken my rules. If I had broken my rules, I might not have anything right now. And, um, you know, that unique view... And an understanding of this market came to me in July of 2017 when the right mentor told me, Cobby, you've got to have a look at this stuff. Uh, I did. I went, wow. It had developed so far from th- 2013. I thought, right, I've got to really get my head into this. Uh, six months later, I dropped everything and I was full-time setting up all, all that we've done so far. And uh, we've got a long, long way to go. And Gavin, it sounds like you do too. Let's keep our eyes open for those green shoots, that regulation and that new that new flag when they put it down and the jet takes off. And uh, as you say, the buffaloes jump off the edge of that cliff. Hopefully it's sometime soon. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Is there anywhere we can find out more information about you read on some of your pieces, anything at all you'd like to share with us? Uh, yeah, I mean, I tend to, um, uh, social media, I'm very active. So, uh, feel free to drop me a line, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, equally, um, on my Twitter, um, Gavin Brown underscore finance. If you want to jump on there as well, always happy to exchange some thoughts and uh, share some ideas. I tend to put my research papers out on there as well. So if you're, if you can stomach an academic paper, um, I've got some stuff coming out on stable coins, uh, comparing things like the, the, the die token from the maker DAO, um, with a few of the other, uh, sort of circle tether type coins as well. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in stable coins in particular, then uh, keep an eye out on my profile. Well, Gavin Brown, ladies and gentlemen, co-founder at Blockchain Capital and senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. That is a mouthful. It will always be a mouthful. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for your insights, both in and outside of government and 
the future of this space. It's uh, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful ride. And the, the last, I share one, one more question with you. I'm going to hold you for one more yeah. question, right? At three o'clock in the morning. Long term, tell me, long term, what's going to happen? Um, long term, I'm actually, uh, I'm slightly bearish when it comes to Bitcoin and crypto coins. Um, I think they, the currencies themselves will persist over time. But for my money, I think when you look at how you spend your money, you know, we as individuals, you spend your money, you don't spend your money directly with government. You spend your money indirectly with through government. In other words, via taxation, yeah. you spend your money directly with multinationals. And actually now with this technology, we're seeing the democratization of money, right? Within three hours, you can have a coin coded and out there. And if you're a multinational and you've got a good enough brand and ecosystem with loyal clients, and now you're in a position where not only can you sell to them and service them, but you can actually also control the monetary system by which they are purchasing your goods, then, and there's no barrier for you to doing that, then potentially you're going to do that. I mean, if you look at companies like Starbucks, they've got $1.3 billion on their balance sheet of mm. people who have prepaid coffee cards. That's more capital reserves than some multinational banks. Um, and why is that the case? It's because people have got faith in the brand, they've got faith in the product. And I think if that faith is there, um, if I was the leader of an organization like that, I'd be like, well, let's try and leverage that with our own, with our own currency. It's just like a loyalty scheme, right? It's just like air miles, but an actual currency that can be cashed out to any, you know, trading pair. So, um, for my money, we'll see the institutionalization of the space, um, for good or for bad. So there'll be centralization, but it does mean that, um, you know, especially platforms and bets like Ethereum, et cetera, which can be that sort of ERC 20 type infrastructure, then things like that will do very well out of it, but it may mean necessarily that you know your Bitcoin, although it will still do well over over time, it may not do as well and become a total money replacement as perhaps people would hope it would be. I guess would be my shout. So I'd also be looking to think about equities in firms who can leverage and use this technology to create their own coins as well to be on that on that sort of watch as well. Wow. So there's a lot to learn. There's a lot going on. And the thing is, when we say long term, we're talking about a generation here. We're not talking about, yeah. we're not talking about crypto long term, which is three years. We're talking about the development of a technology that can truly change the world and, and, and re, reshape the way that business is done, the way that we transact and how we cooperate love or hate a certain brand can come down to all of this. And uh, whilst that's going on, we got a lot of work to do, man. We got a lot of work to do. Indeed, indeed. And thanks Thank again. You for your I, time. I have no more secret sneaky questions. Appreciate it very much. Keep in touch and I wish you all the best going forward. Oh, star man. You too, Craig. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. The Trader Cobb Crypto Podcast is hosted by Craig Cobb. All Trader Cobb courses, products, and tools can be found at tradercobb.com because experience matters.